Okay, we're all set. Okay, so, um, hi everyone. So uh, we are really glad today to have Dr. Azep um, to uh, give us the Grand Round talk today. And um, uh, Dr. Azep is completing his um, um, laboratory genetics and genomics training in University of Columbia. He is uh, also a um, tenured associate professor at uh, University of Jordan. And he has spent more than a decade's time in the field of um, human genetics. Uh, he got his PhD in University of Commonwealth University, um, Virginia Commonwealth University, and um, uh, where he performed uh, genetic research and also uh, um, um, had um, um, training in uh, um, business administration. After he received his PhD, um, he, um, he, he stayed as uh, a visiting scientist in the molecular diagnostic lab in the uh, uh, University um, Commonwealth um, University, the Virginia Commonwealth University, sorry, um, and for one year. And afterwards he returned to Jordan where, um, where he performed clinical diagnosis and research in genetics um, for about seven years. And in 2020, he returned to US um, and spent about a year's time in the prevention genetics uh, diagnostic laboratory on um, sabbatical where he um, performed um, genetic diagnosis um, by axon sequencing and as well as developing new tests and um, 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 using um, axon as a, a, a diagnostic tool. Uh, at this point, he has decided to return to US for his career and he started his training as a laboratory genetics and genomics fellow uh, at University of Columbia um, ab around 2021. So we are glad to have him here to give us a talk about um, uh, using genetic technology to um, offer better diagnosis and management of uh, rare human diseases. And um, here, here, here's um, um, the floor is for you, Dr. Aitken. Thank you, Dr. Zeng. It's a pleasure to share with you uh, some of the work we've been doing in the field. So as a, uh, a group, the incidence of uh, single gene disorders in the pediatric population is one per 300 life-born infants. And over the entire lifetime, the prevalence of single gene disorders is one in 50. And the prevalence is even higher when stratifying in healthcare centers for example, this is a retrospective review of over 15,000 pediatric emergency department visits at Lincoln Medical and Mental Health Center. Over 18% were by patients who had known or suspected genetic uh, disorders, and 2.8% were by previously diagnosed patients with genetic disorders. Sorry, um, I just want to make sure that, that your screen is shared. Right now, I don't see the slide. Well, I apologize. Okay, let me double check. Uh, I, we can see it here. We can see the slides. You can see them? Yeah, I think we can see it. We probably see on your terminal, your computer. Okay, okay yeah, let me ahead. stop sharing and share again, just, just in case. In case, okay, sure. Share screen. All right. See it now? Yeah, yes. we can see it. Mm -hmm. okay. We can you see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. So with that introduction, in this talk, I'm going to overview families with different hereditary diseases and the impact of genetic testing, specifically whole exome sequencing, and their diagnosis and management. So let's start by going over two families with neonatal or infantile gastrointestinal diseases. In this family, a one-month-old male infant presented with severe dehydration and failure to thrive. The pregnancy was complicated by oligohydramnio, however, with no significant effect on the baby or mother. On admission, the patient was non-syndromic, severely dehydrated, pale, tachypanic, hypoxic with oxygen saturation at late 60s, and cachectic. The diarrhea 
had been present continuously since birth with up to 10 non-bloody loose stools daily. However, he had no vomiting or abnormal movement. Laboratory findings revealed electrolyte imbalance. He had hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis, hypernatremia, hypokalemia, hypercalcemia, and hypermagnesium. Therefore, at first, the patient was kept NPO, fluid management using appropriate fluid solution, corrected the metabolic abnormalities and electrolyte imbalance. But as feeding was reintroduced, the patient diarrhea reappeared, pointing to an underlying osmotic malabsorptive mechanism. And those are several formulas that have failed to alleviate the diarrhea. IPEX was suspected in his differential diagnosis. IPEX is an X-linked recessive immunologic disorder that's characterized by onset in infancy of severe diarrhea due to enteropathy. His immunological workup showed a decrease in relative and absolute numbers of CD8 and increase in CD4 uh, CD8 ratio. He had no hyperglycemia, but his thyroid stimulating hormone was elevated and was started on ithyroxine. The decision was to start him on steroid, which made no difference to his co condition. Neither anti enterocytes, antibodies, nor Fox B3 gene testing were available at the time. Further investigations encompassed small bowel follow through which showed normal intestinal length, normal bowel distribution, and normal position of the widener duodenal junction. Sweat chloride test was within the normal range, and the targeted mutation analysis of CT CFTR showed no cystic fibrosis candidate disease-causing variants. Up upper endoscopy showed normal esophagus, stomach, and duodenum, and the electron microscopy showed normal villi and microvilli with no evidence to suggest tufting enteropathy and no inclusion bodies to suggest macrovillus inclusion disease. The histopathology was, uh, show, is shown here at uh, four and eight months of age. It showed normal crypt and villus architecture, normal distribution of goblet and panic cells, no increase in intraepithelial lymphocytes, and there was no cryptic hyperplasia, no microorganisms were identified on the surface or in the lumen. These findings made the possibility of malabsorption, i.e. celiac disease, very unlikely. And furthermore, the celiac serology was negative. The patient was kept in hospital on minimal oral feed, TPN, and supplemented with modified oral rehydration solution after each water is stored. He remained significantly below the third percentile for weight, height, and head circumference. And during the time of genetic analysis, after eight months of hospitalization, at the age of 15 months, the patient passed away. The clinical assess uh, assessment and laboratory tests, they were successful to exclude the majority of differential diagnosis categories. However, the diagnosis was not established. So in pursuit, of reaching correct diagnosis, child unexplained and challenging condition, we decided to utilize whole exome sequencing. I'm showing here a pileup image of his exome. It shows a G to C substitution, which is a, 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 on the genomic level that is equivalent on the C dot level to C to G, which is a novel missense uh, mutation in neuroG3 gene changing the amino acid threonine to arginine at position 138. The online Mendelian inheritance of man lists neuroG3 to be causative of autosomal recessive congenital malabsorptive diarrhea. This missense variant was extremely low in the normal population database nomad, indicating it's not a common benign variant. It, the list on the right side is different in silico tools, unanimously predicting its impact to be deleterious. And the patient homozygous missense variant causing threonine to be replaced to arginine 
So trying to reduce the contact. Causing the threonine to be replaced to arginine is located in the helix loop helix domain. Six missense disease causing variants have been previously reported in literature. Four of them are in the same domain. This variant is also located in a conserved region across related species. Afterwards, we performed Sanger sequencing for the segregation analysis, which revealed his older brother to be homozygous for the wild type variant, as you can see, the chromatogram showing the C the peak. Whereas the mother, she's heterozygous, you can see the overlapping black and blue showing that she is uh, CG. And this is the Sanger signal for the homozygous mutant variant. This figure shows the molecular dynamic simulation analysis. So panel A here is the location of the variant. So uh, remember that uh, the arginine is the mutant amino acid and the threonine is the, the wild type. So in green color is the DNA, and this is the uh, helix loop helix domain interacting uh, with, the, with the DNA. Panel B is comparing the conformational change between neuroG3 wild type depicted in red color and the mutated form in yellow color. Amino acids at the margin of the DNA binding domain down here are annotated to show the differences in the location and orientation. And C is a top view of the local differences between the wild type and the mutant, the mutant form. There are differences in the tilt and location of alpha helices involved in the location of the coiled coils. Collectively, this demonstrates that the substitution of threonine with arginine led to global changes of neuroG3 orientation affecting its DNA binding capacity. With an increase of uh, inner 100 kilocalorie per mole uh, protein energy. The clinical impact of neuroG3 was discovered back in 2006 in three patients with phenotypes similar to our patient. And it's now well established uh, that the neuroG3 causes enteric and endocrinosis that's characterized by severe malabsorptive diarrhea due to lack of intestinal enteroendocrine cells. Therefore, chromogranin A and synaptofusin in uh, IHCs were done retrospectively to examine the presence of enteroendocrine cells. We found that our patient had a significant depletion in the enteroendocrine cells compared to the age match control and the adult controls. And synaptofusin stain also showed marked decrease in the enteroendocrine cells compared to the uh, controls. The genetic testing defined the correct diagnosis, and if it was performed at an earlier stage, it would have led to proper management from the beginning. It also helped the family reach closure and pursue family planning for the next child. Now I'm going, uh, now I'm going to talk about another family with a two-month-old baby, Proband 2-2. She's born to a consanguineous parents. She suffered from prolonged neonatal jaundice, and there is a family history of early neonatal deaths, and her older brother, uh, individual 2-2, was also is, is diagnosed with polystatic liver disease, which started in early childhood. Now he is 26 year old. Her workup was normal except for the elevated liver enzymes, AST, ALT, ALP, but she had a normal level of uh, GGT. And she also had prolonged PT and PTT. And the investigations also uh, encompassed ultrasound and hepatobiliary uh, immunodiacetic acid scan, HIDA. The level ultrasound was normal. And the findings of HIDA showed that there is prompt liver uptake of tracer with complete absence of cardiac activity in about five minutes, indicative of normal hepatocellular function. There is biliary to bowel transit with visualization of bowel activity on early and on delayed images, excluding biliary atresia. And uh, 
I'm going to try to play the video for you. So this image here shows the one minute uh, dynamic liver uptake obtained after one hour. And the lower image shows the delayed dynamic image for liver obtained two hours afterwards. The conclusion was normal biliary to bowel transit with no conclusive evidence of biliary atresia. Thus, a liver biopsy was required for further testing, and the HNE staining revealed severe cholestatic hepatitis. As you can see, there are hepatocyte ballooning and feathery changes with marked intrahepatic cholestasis. Mild periporter inflammation and foci of spotty necrosis are also present in her biopsy. Both probands uh, were tested for urine bile salt through fast atom bombardment spec, and it revealed elevated bile salts in urine, which is surrogate to elevated serum bile salts, i.e. cholestasis. So considering the fact that infantile cholestasis represents a heterogeneous hereditary group, and given the family history of hepatic disease, exome sequencing was performed to the probant. We identified a homozygous dinucleotide deletion and a gene called HSD3B7. And this uh, dinucleotide deletion is located in exon two out of the seven exons uh, this gene has. And it leads to uh, a frame shift and premature termination at amino acid number 26. Uh, this uh, truncating variant is impacting uh, the different transcripts of this gene, including the second canonical transcript. Furthermore, the, uh, uh, the allele count for this dinucleotide deletion variant is extremely low in the population database nomad with absence of homozygous heads. OMIM lists HSD3B7 to be causative of autosomal recessive congenital bile acid synthesis defect, which is characterized by a neonatal onset of progressive liver disease with cholestatic jaundice and malabsorption of lipid and lipid soluble vitamins resulting from one year uh, primary failure to synthesize bile acids. In most forms of the disorder, there is a favorable response to oral bile acid therapy. And based on these genetic findings, at 11 months old, the patient was put on second choice medication, urodeoxycholic acid, waiting for the first choice drug, cholic acid, acid, to be available. Her successful diagnosis could have been a blessing for her affected older brother as well, had he been properly diagnosed at the beginning. And even though he's alive now, he suffered from liver cirrhosis which could have been preventable with the use of proper medications. Uh, furthermore, the family history of early neonatal deaths could have been avoided. Now let's switch gears and talk about the genetics of ophthalmic diseases, specifically inherited retinal dystrophies. Uh, I'm gonna overview uh, a few introductory slides. So the optics of the eye create a focused two-dimensional image of the visual world on the retina. And the retina consists of several layers of neurons that are connected by synapses, and it's supported by the outer layer of pigment epithelial cells. The pigmentary light sensing cells in the retina are the photoreceptor cells, which are of two types, cones and rods. Rods function mainly in dim light and provide black and white vision, while cones function in well-lit conditions and they are responsible for perception of color as well as high acuity vision used for tasks such as reading. The way I remember it, cones for color, rod for black and white. The optic disc is the site of entry of nerves toward the optic nerve, and the macula is the central part of the retina. It has the highest concentration of cone cells, thus it's responsible for central vision, high resolution vision as well. So the central vision will be impaired if the macula is damaged. Now, the inherited retinal dystrophies, abbreviated as IRDs, are heterogeneous inherited retinal disorders on both clinic, uh, uh, phenotypic and genetic level. They are characterized by progressive retinal degeneration over time, and the worldwide prevalence is around 1 in 3,000. Of the non-syndromic inherited retinal dystrophies, Retinitis pigmentosa is the most common. 
The initial symptoms of RP or night pigmentosa is nyctalopia, which is night blindness. And that's how a normal vision would uh, per perceive uh, this field. This initial symptoms of nyctalopia is followed by uh, peripheral vision loss that uh, progress to the center known as tunnel vision. The ophthalmic assessment of inherited retinal dystrophies and specifically retinitis pigmentosa encompass those four tests, visual acuity, fundus imaging, optic coherence tomography, OCT, electroretinography. I will briefly tap on the principles and utility of each test. So the first one, visual acuity, it refers basically to our ability to discern the shapes and details of the things we see. In other words, uh, visual acuity measures the clarity and sharpness of the vision, and it's assessed through the Snellen chart. And it's calculated by dividing the test distance over the letter size. This table here shows how visual acuity is reported either in decimal notation, US notation, or one meter notation. For example, a normal vision, a decimal notation is one, US notation is 20 over 20, and in one meter notation is one over one. The second uh, ophthalmic assessment for the retina is fundus imaging. So basically the ophthalmologist dilates the pupil of the eye. That's Mohammed, uh, the ophthalmologist uh, uh, in our team, looking at one of our patients' retina. So that's how the normal retina or the normal fundus looks like. And this is the triad of the retinitis pigmentosa, which are uh, retinal pigments, also known as bony spicules, thin or attenuated uh, blood vessels, and waxy or pale optic disc. The third retinal assessment is uh, OCT, optic coherence tomography, and it allows for the assessment of the retinal layer details. The upper image is just from the internet showing the actual OCT device, but the lower images are examples uh, of normal versus RP image is of the retina of uh, the patients that we've been working, uh, working with. So while the OCT allows for the identification of structural abnormalities in the retina, the electroretinography provides a, me a mean and a measure for evaluating the retinal function by recording the elect electrophysiological response to flashing stimulation. So the left side of this slide shows an example of uh, a normal pair of eyes and one of, uh, one of the uh, RP patients. OD is the right eye and O is, is the left eye. So as you can see, uh, the signal is plateau for both eyes for the rods uh, in an affected individual compared to a stimulation, to rods being stimulated uh, for a normal individual. This is also a plateau. Again, you can see when both uh, next rod and cones are stimulated. And finally, and three, at 30 hertz, the cones are stimulated, but they're not responding uh, when the retina is not functioning. The, gen the genes associated with inherited retinal dystrophies are still emerging uh, over the past several years. We've, we have tested more than 100 families diagnosed uh, by our collaborator ophthalmologist with inherited retinal dystrophies. And here is one of the families. As you can see, it's an extended consanguineous family with multiple affected individuals. What caught our attention in this family is the heterogeneous clinical presentation. It was really interesting. So if you look at the ophthalmic assessment table here, the initial findings or the first symptoms, the left side of the family, let's call it side A, their initial symptoms were low visual acuity. Whereas the right side of the family, the affected individuals, initial symptoms were uh, nyctalopia. Remember, night blindness. The OCT and fundus imaging for the representative patients from each side of the family revealed variable degrees of central macular atrophy. And the ERG for uh, a proband from each side of the family showing that uh, severe, there is a severe reduction in both scotopic and photopic responses. 
we performed an exome sequencing for one affected individual for each side of the family. And I'm just sharing with you here our uh, variant filtration approach. This is the initial uh, number of variants of the exome. And then we filtered for a rate depth of more than 10. And then we looked at the variants uh, that are within a coding or splice regions, followed, that, followed by filtering variants in genes uh, associated with inherited retinal dystrophies. And based on the mode of inheritance, which is um, uh, autosomal recessive, uh, we filtered for homozygous and compound heterozygous variants. And then afterwards, we filtered for rare variants with a minor allele frequency in the population database of less than 1%. And the final step was to filter the variants based on in silico prediction and uh, segregation analysis through Sanger sequencing. So for the left side of the family, for this individual specifically, we identified uh, a splice side variant, as you can see here. On the genomic coordinate, it is C to T, but on the C dot, it's co the complementary strand, G to A, and a gene known as ABCA4. This variant has never been reported in literature. However, it was submitted to ClinVar database. And the patient was uh, homozygous, as you can see, for this variant. What was interesting that the other individual from the right side of the family is homozygous for a, for a variant in a different gene, in a gene called CLRN1. And uh, it's interesting that also, uh, the, the variant itself exists in a, a splice site a location. So uh, just to share with you more details about uh, the homozygous splice site variant in ABCA4, uh, the variant is predicted by different in silico tools to impact splicing and predicted to cause exon skipping resulting in out of frame transcript. It's, it's extremely low in the population database uh, and absent, uh, and, and the homozygous counts are absent for this variant. So we designed primers that are flanking the region of this variant, and we sequenced affected and unaffected family members. And sure enough, the patients were uh, homozygous mutant for this G2A variant, green color is the A, uh, and where I, whereas the unaffected individuals were either homozygous uh, for the G, or heterozygous, uh, including the parents. Now, let's switch to the right side of the pedigree. Here, uh, it's a different gene, uh, CLRN1, and uh, it's also a splice site variant that's uh, you know, predicted by splicing tools to affect splice, splicing donor site. Right. Likewise, it's uh, uh, very rare in the population database with no homozygous counts, and this variant is an oval variant. We followed the segregation approach for this side of the family. We designed primers flanking this uh, specific variant in CLRN1 gene, and uh, this homozygous variant was indeed present in the affected individuals, whereas the unaffected were uh, homozygous wild type or heterozygous. So uh, the, the, in the CLRN1, the splice donor variant, uh, it was uh, G2A. And it, in this genome browser, it's located here. So what we did afterwards for this novel variant in CLRN1, we performed a simulation analysis between the U1 subunit of the uh, splice zone of the SNR and uh, the uh, CLRN1 uh, uh, RNA. So panel A is the best docking pose between the wild type RNA and U1 splice zone subunit. B is showing the interacting atoms between G from the wild type RNA and with the C from the splice zone U1 subunit. And panel C is showing that those interactions are lost when the G is substituted with an A. So uh, uh, the right side of the family, family 1B patient, 
they had no associated symptoms with retinitis pigmentosa, and thus were considered to have non-syndromic RP or non-syndromic retinitis pigmentosa. However, when the exome sequencing showed that the uh, disease-causing variant is in CLRN1, uh, and CLRN1 itself it has been a reported to cause autosomal recessive Asher syndrome in uh, OMIM uh, database. Therefore, this warranted for further audiometric evaluation to rule in or rule out hearing problems. So uh, pure tune audiometry was performed for those four patients, and it revealed that they have differential, different degrees of bilateral sensorineural deafness in all patients confirming the diagnosis of Asher syndrome. Actually, those patients were diagnosed with type 3 Usher syndrome because her, their hearing was normal at birth and they don't have balance problems. Therefore, the diagnosis was corrected from non-syndromic uh, retinitis pigmentosa to Usher uh, syndrome type 3, and consequently, they were referred to the ANT for hearing management. We shared the variants we identified and their clinical correlation with the community by submitting them to the uh, disease database, ClinVar. And it's worth mentioning that the eye is considered an immune privileged organ. Um, Adeno associated virus can be loaded with a normal version of the gene and utilized as a delivery vehicle by intravitreal or subretinal injection to compensate for the mutated gene. And as a matter of fact, the FDA did approve gene therapy five years ago for RPE-65. So now I'm going to switch gears and talk about uh, the genetics of hearing loss with uh, a brief background. So hearing loss can be categorized based on the parts of the affected ear into conductive, sensorineural, and mixed. Conductive hearing loss is when the abnormalities are in the external ear or the ossicles of the middle ear. Sensoneural is when the cochlea of the inner ear is affected. And both the conductive and, uh, con sorry, conductive and sensoneural are affected in the mixed type of hearing loss. Hearing loss can also be categorized based on severity into four main categories, mild, moderate, severe, and profound. And you can see here the decibel range uh, of each category along with its subcategories. And this is just an example of an audiogram of a patient with unilateral sensorineural hearing loss. The X axis here is the frequency in Hertz, and the Y axis is the uh, intensity of the, of the sound in decibels. And you can see the uh, drop off in hearing threshold on the left ear, especially at higher frequency. 80% of prelingual hearing loss is of genetic etiology, which is divided into non-syndromic and syndromic. The, and there are over 400 genetic syndromes that include hearing loss. Some, like Wardenberg syndrome and neurofibromatosis type two, have autosomal dominant mode of, mode of inheritance. Others, such as Asher's and Pendred, they have autosomal recessive, but are also extinct and mitochondrial uh, syndromic disorders. And this table is showing the causative genes for some of the syndromic uh, hearing loss diseases. The other group is non-syndromic, which uh, is responsible for 80% of uh, the genetic etiology of the hearing loss. And this is a historic timeline of non-syndromic hearing loss genes discovery with the first discovered in 1995. Currently, there are around 138 genes causing non-syndromic hearing loss. With this number of causative genes, the type of non-syndromic hearing loss are named based on the mode of inheritance. So DFNA for autosomal dominant, DFNB for autosomal recessive, DFNX for X-linked, and the number following the letters reflects the order of the gene based on its mapping and uh, or, or discovery. Um, in this section, I'm going to focus on three families with multiple affected individuals who were initially diagnosed with non-syndromic hearing loss. 
This table shows the audiological findings and investigations for those three families. Uh, the column here, the severity column of the hearing loss, shows that the patients were affected with either sensorineural hearing loss or mixed type, and the hearing loss ranged from uh, moderately severe to profound for those patients. The next column shows that the hearing loss for all of the patients has deteriorated over time. And uh, this column here is showing that as an intervention, the patients received cochlear implants or hearing aids. We performed exome sequencing for those families and identified disease-causing variants in a gene called SLC26A4. In families one and three, the, the patients were homozygous for a novel splice acceptor variant uh, due to a change on the C dot level from a G to a C, while in family two, the patients were compound heterozygous for a previously reported missense variant and a novel nonsense variant at, um, at amino acid number uh, 482 and exon uh, 13. All of those variants are located in the sulfate permease domain. The gene, SLC26A4, encodes a transmembrane protein called pendrin. It plays a role in maintaining the homeostasis of the endolymph in the inner ear. And the right side cartoon shows the location of the endolymphatic sac. Pathogenic variants in SLC26A4 are associated with autosomal uh, uh, recessive Pendrit syndrome and autosomal recessive uh, uh, deafness, DFNB4. Both the enlarged hearing loss, uh, both encompass hearing loss and enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So to investigate the enlarged vestibular aqueduct, the EVA, Temporal CT scan were performed and revealed that all affected members in the three families, they indeed had the enlarged vestibular aqueduct. And this is a representative CT scan for the enlarged vestibular aqueduct uh, of one of the tested patients. So the normal range, range is between 0.3 and 1.5 millimeter. And as you can see, both the left ear both the right ear and the left ear, they are above 1.5, rendering them as enlarged. And Pendred is defined as a genetic syndrome that's characterized by bilateral sensorineural hearing loss and ear thyroid goiter. So the performed investigations led to the differential diagnosis of Pendred syndrome and DFNB4. They both have overlapping features of enlarged vestibular aqueduct and hearing loss, and SLC26A4 as a causative gene. The distinguishing feature of Pendred is the thyroid manifestations. Therefore, thyroid ultrasound and thyroid lab tests were performed. And this table details the thyroid ultrasound and the lab profile uh, and the thyroid uh, hormone profile this slide looks busy, so I'm going to summarize the results in the actual families. All of the patients in those different families, they all have deafness and enlarged vestibular aqueduct. But let's look at family one, for example. Let's look at this individual here and the fourth generation. And, uh, she has, uh, as all of the other patients, deafness with enlarged vestibular aqueduct. But furthermore, she has euthyroid and goiter. Therefore, her final diagnosis is Pendred syndrome. If you compare her with her brother, who also has deafness and enlarged vestibular aqueduct, he also has euthyroid without goiter. Therefore, this patient um, is uh, diagnosed as DFNB4. Now, if you look at their brother, individual three in this generation, he has. Uh, of course, the deafness and uh, EVA, but also he has uh, eothyroid with elevated thyroid globulin, uh, which renders his differential diagnosis as atypical pendrid. 
So those findings, they show that there are variability in the differential diagnosis for the same variants, intra and interfamilial. So as a recap for this story, families with initial diagnosis of non-syndromic hearing loss that underwent genetic testing, which revealed disease-causing variants in SLC26A4, uh, and this gene could cause either DFNB4 or Pindrit syndrome. Therefore, we pursued uh, this testing with temporal CT scan, uh, uh, ultrasound, and uh, thyroid uh, hormone profile to redirect the uh, clinical diagnosis for better management. And uh, to, to wrap up the story by discussing the uh, management, so a typical Pindrit patients should follow up for malignant transformations. Thi th thiazide diuretics should not be administered for Pindrit patients to avoid complications of hypovolemic and metabolic acidosis, metabolic alkalosis, sorry. And atypical Pindrit uh, patients should have the thyroid profile added to their periodic healthcare even if the patient is not manifesting with thyroid-related symptoms. And the DFNB4 patients, along with typical and atypical Pindrit, they all should be followed up by ENT physicians. Uh, the fourth uh, category of this talk uh, is about uh, a study on patients we've been doing on patients with uh, congenital heart diseases. And we've been performing this study along with uh, uh, our collaborators uh, at your institution in Yale, uh, with uh, Sakib Lahja and uh, uh, Lee Jin, uh, Wei Zin. Um, so uh, one of the families was an infant with cyanosis and respiratory distress. Uh, she was a 12-month-old female with who presented to the ER with a cyanosis and respiratory distress. The physical examination showed a cyanotic infant with tachypenia and tachycardia. She had no apparent dysmorphic facial features. An evaluation by chest radiography showed normal size of the heart, but with significant lung congestion, consistent with obstruction of the pulmonary venous drainage. The, those are the echocardiogram findings. The echo evaluation showed mixed type total anomalous pulmonary venous retain, tab VR, with obstruction of pulmonary vein. There was a drainage of the pulmonary vein to the posterior aspect of the superior vena cava with significant obstruction at its entry. Pulmonary venous flow was also seen draining below the diaphragm to the inferior uh, caval vein. The right ventricle was dilated and hypertrophic with moderate tricapsid regurgitation. The left atrium was small with right to left shunt at the atrial septum. The left ventricle appeared adequate in size with normal function, and the ventricular septum was intact. Uh, the infant was admitted to the PID ICU on supplementary oxygen, and CT angiogram was done the following day to confirm the complex pulmonary venous anatomy. CT, the CT scan showed that the right pulmonary venous confluence drained to the posterior uh, rightward aspect of the superior vein, and the left-sided venous, venous confluence forced behind the left atrium and descended through the diaphragm and drained to the inferior uh, canal vein via Crouch's route. The patient was transferred to the cardiac center for urgent surgical repair, but unfortunately, at the age of one month, she died before surgery from respiratory failure. Family history and clinical assessment revealed intrafamilial phenotypic variability of heterogeneous heart defect. The proban had mixed type total anomalous pulmonary venous return, whereas her mother, she had atrial septal defect. As a rare cardiac anomaly, the finding of TAB-VR triggered a genetic workup to better understand the abnormal clinical presentation at the molecular level. The affected proband, along with her parents, underwent exome sequencing um, at Yale University, and the trio-based West analyze revealed a maternally inherited heterozygous nonsense disease-causing variant and TBX5 gene. 
And here is the details of the identified disease causing variant. It's a truncating mutation at exon number six. And, and uh, it's located in a region uh, that's within the T-box domain, and it's a conserved region. And in order to explore the effect of this nonsense variant on the protein level, uh, we perform a routine modeling analysis to compare the structure of the wild type on the left side versus the mutant on the right side. A significant reduction in the number of non-covalent bond interactions was noticed, which clarifies the less stable state of the mutated dimer form. The reduction of the number of non-covalent bonds may affect the stability of the dimer forming and thus its binding to DNA. Alternatively, nonsense mediated decay is also a possible mechanism as the distance between the three prime end of the exon, uh, three prime end exon exon junction is more than 55 nucleotide. PBX5 is known to cause autosomal dominant uh, cardiac disease known as Holt or Ram syndrome, and which is characterized by skeletal anomalies uh, of the upper limbs, along with the congenital heart defects. This finding granted reevaluating the clinical diagnosis of the probands non syndromic cardiac anomalies to be part of a manifestation of fault or rams. A thorough assessment of the family's medical history revealed that the mother who is carrying the same variant does indeed have bi uh, bilateral trifalangeal thumbs in her, uh, and, sorry, uh, unilateral trifalangeal thumb, and she declared that her deceased child had a bilateral trifurrential thumb. So uh, the pre those, our finding extended the phenotypic cardiac defect associated with holt oram syndrome. And to the best of our knowledge, this is the first association of mixed type TAB-VR with TBX5. Prior to the current analysis, the molecular association of TAB-VR with holt oram has never been documented before. Hence, this is the first genetic investigation to report the association between total anomalous pulmonary venous return and Holt or M syndrome. And this is just a slide uh, summarizing our finding where we guided the differential diagnosis from a non syndromic congenital heart disease and to a syndromic uh, skeletal uh, and cardiac uh, manifestations. Our work has been uh, published in literature through a series of articles. And I would like to wrap up by acknowledging uh, people who played a significant role in this work. Um, Donia, she's a, a research assistant in our lab. Bayan, she's a medical student. Zain was a former uh, lab member. Currently, she's a third year PhD student at Baylor College of Medicine. Muawiyah and Mohammed, they are the ophthalmologists. Hashim is a um, GP, general physician. Lena is a research assistant. Mohammed uh, is an ENT. And Maamun Hatmel uh, is a biochemist who helped with the simulation analysis. Svenia is a physician from uh, Leipzig University. She spent a year uh, with us working on uh, the inherited retinal dystrophy disease. Mariam, uh, she worked with the gastrointestinal diseases in our group. She's currently a third year PhD student in Washu in St. Louis. Omar is a physician and he's currently now doing a PhD in the University of Iowa. Iyad is the pediatric gastroenterologist. The other Iyad is the cardiac, uh, is the a pediatric cardiologist. And as a matter of fact, he did his fellowship at Yale and he uh, looped in uh, Sakib and Weijin to join uh, our work on uh, the genetics of congenital heart diseases. And I wanna also acknowledge Sammy, um, from Partners Healthcare, where I did a sabbatical back in 2016, um, um, during the time when the American College of Medical Genetics uh, guidelines were updated. And uh, thank you for bearing with me. Thank you so much for a very interesting talk. Um, any questions from the audience? I see Bonnie's hand up. Uh, hi, ahead, Bonnie. 
Hi, Bilal. Hi. A great talk. I have a very general question for you. I, I would like to gauge your, um, I mean, um, your, what is your uh, uh, interpretation of the scenario? So now since we have, we are actually moving from exome sequencing to whole genome sequencing because the sequencing cost is coming down uh, drastically. And this year, especially we are going to see almost 60% drop in the sequencing cost uh, by November. So do you think uh, moving away from exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing will add some extra value and how you see those variants which we are going to see in the non-coding region will going to add value to those interpretation of um, situation with the patients? I think it's pros and cons. So uh, whole genome sequencing will be able to identify uh, more structural variants, including invergence, copy number variants. Uh, the rate depth is lower. So if you look at mosaicism um, or if you do prenatal genetic testing where you have some maternal cell contamination that might have um, a pitfall in using whole genome. Another challenge for whole genome, even though the sequencing cost itself is becoming lower and more affordable, uh, the cloud storage cost, that's gonna be also a challenge. Uh, I remember, just don't quote me on this, top of my head, an exome is 12 gigabytes fast cube and VCF, whereas a genome for one individual is 120 gigabytes. So you're on computer storage, so you're talking about 10 times more storage on the cloud. Yet, uh, I think it's the way to go once those logistics are uh, you know, more depth and, and more affordable cloud storage taken care of. So maybe it could be that it's a reflex uh, for those causes, or it could be as a first line. I think it depends on the, on the institution's policy. And another factor that just came to my mind is the insurance coverage. Would the insurance be willing to cover the cost of whole genome? Exome, it's still a challenge with them. So I think having the approvals would be also something that the insurance uh, play a role in. Thank you so much. Mustafa, I see your hands up. Hey, Bilal, that was really awesome. Uh, so uh, very exciting results. You know, one of the things that was clear is that the structural simulation of the variants was helpful for annotating them. Uh, in the cases that you presented, most of them, it, it looked like at least had really nice structures already solved. You know, there's these new tools out there like AlphaFold, for example, that can predict structure. I was wondering if you tried that at all for modeling variant impact uh, when you don't actually have a very well-established crystal structure. I, I wonder if any of your, I don't know if you're collaborating with the biophysics colleagues, if they tried that uh, to help you sort of annotate variants of unknown significance. You know, I think the simulation analysis, those studies that you're highlighting on, uh, they are valuable because, as you said, they are revealing uh, an insight from a different perspective. And the question I had in my mind, you know, how to implement those findings in the uh, classification criteria of the variants? Because I felt those are definitely not the in silico tools, uh, classical in silico tools, but maybe it's time to consider them as uh, pieces of evidence along with the uh, functional studies, even though there are sort of dry lab functional studies rather than with classical wet lab findings. And as a matter of fact, those simulation studies, we adapted them uh, through a collaboration at the University of Jordan uh, with uh, a colleague who's been using them to look at uh, drug target interaction. And we just modified them to look at the interaction of the, you know, DNA and the spliceosome as opposed to a drug target. And your, your, your case are definitely very, very interesting, also very unique because the um, enriched the consanguineous family. Um, you, you certainly pick a more recessive uh, condition as you, you present. When you analyze exon, do you actually need to modify why you now in the, in the, in the uh, uh, Columbia for the training, when you analyze exome for no bug consanguineous family for, for sort of background, do you actually modify your algorithm for the exome to, to what exists in many other sort of places, uh, which is the populations and not consanguineous in general, to help you enhance that discovery? Yes, so one of the differences between Jordan and Columbia 
is the population databases. Uh, and it's less represented in that part of the world, the Middle Eastern uh, population. And we were relying on the population database, but we supplemented that with um, uh, internal uh, exomes uh, to learn and out uh, certain variants as we were filtering. We also looked at uh, we also looked at uh, there is a middle uh, there is a, actually a less popular uh, uh, database uh, Middle Eastern population database that's available online. And in regard to consanguinity, what I noticed is that in uh, in consanguinous families, your first impression when you look at the pedigree, you it would fool me. It looks as autosomal dominant because every generation is affected. But then when looking more closely at the family, you would see that even though every generation is affected, but some parents of affected children are not affected. And the challenge is, is it indeed uh, recessive disease or is it uh, reduced penetrance disease? So I think uh, handling the families uh, in consanguineous populations, uh, they are slightly different when looking at the mode of inheritance and uh, consequently, uh, tweaking your filtration uh, parameters. Thank you. Um, anyone else with questions? No, uh, before I, people go, uh, I want to, it's Penn is still on the panel. I saw him, it's on. But anyway, I'm making this a short announcement. Um, as uh, some of you know already, and the Penny uh, Lee is our CIDO director, um, just promoting from a social professor to full professor official last week. So I want to you uh, all join me, congratulate uh, him for this well-deserved promotion. Uh, and I'm not sure she, he's on. He was on before, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, my video is not on. <laughs> so it's a well-deserved promotion. I think, Penny, we will find time to celebrate uh, sometimes. Thank you, everyone. So thank you, everyone. And thank you, Dr. Azad. And uh, we will definitely stay in touch. And hopefully, you'll visit us soon. Yeah. Thank you. And I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, Dr. Lauren Jeffries, who has also been uh, playing a significant role in the heart diseases. I apologize for uh, missing your name. Uh, Please accept my apologies. Oh, no worries. Okay. You guys did most of the work on that. So <laughs> great to hear your work, uh, Bilal. It was really super exciting. Thank you, Mustafa. And we're looking forward to uh, collaboration with you on the on the uh, animal studies. Looks great.